Welcome back to Hello Nigeria. We're having our next conversation with our second guest in the studio. She is a pharmacist and a public health consultant with over 15 years experience in pharmaceutical management. She is the owner and the principal consultant of RX 3.0 Pharmacy. And today she'll be coming to join us to talk about drug abuse, drug overuse, and everything within that space. Thank you, Dr. Dumebi Mordi, for joining us. I'm honored to be here. It's a delight to have you. Thank you. I'm, I'm very interested in the conversation we're having because this is something that we cannot look away from we have a drug abuse problem Absolutely. i don't know if you saw the bbc documentary that oh, highlighted the abuse of um codeine yes and now people are exploring other ideas other things yes what what are your thoughts on drug abuse in nigeria yeah so basically you know the bbc expose was a good eye opener for most of us but by and large the issue with drug abuse in nigeria has been going on for a very long time and it starts off relatively harmless you know you you go to a pharmacy you have a cough they give you a cough syrup with codeine in it which is a perfectly good use of codeine but then what happens is your cough has gone away and you're now drinking the cough syrup around the clock because you feel kind of sedated calm your mind is, you know, a bit cooler and, you know, we're in a stressful state, you know. And so by and large, a lot of people start off using it for appropriate indications and reasons. And then they veer off into another area that's kind of where we become drug abuse, so to speak. So I think by and large in Nigeria, our challenge is we start off with one thing. And it's a good thing because codeine is a good um, treatment for coughs. But then you end up going into kind of a gray area where you become dependent on it. And codeine in itself um, is good for pain treatment in addition to coughs. But at the same time, it kind of dulls what's called your respiratory center in your brain. So it ends up getting to a point where when you overdose, you just simply stop breathing and you may die sometimes in your sleep. So while most people think it's relatively harmless, it really isn't. So I would suggest by and large that one, you always have to have a physician on board that will monitor the use of codeine. Two, don't use it when you don't need it, meaning somebody has prescribed a, a product with a particular ingredient in it, once that disease has gone away, maybe a cough or your pain, you stop using it. You don't start drinking it as part of your Coca-Cola and things like that. All right. Um, beyond mentioning coding, what would you say are some of the most abused uh, medication, most abused drugs in Nigeria? I think the UN did a, a report in 2017, and they found that the most um, widely abused substance in Nigeria is cannabis, marijuana, uh, MJ, Mary Jane, whatever you call it. Um, they found about 10.6 million users in 2017 alone, most of which were adults between the ages of 25 to 39. And um, what ended up happening is they start smoking marijuana rec recreatively and being told that, oh, it's herbal, it's a natural product, it's a plant, what have you. So you don't really feel like, you know, it's a drug, so to speak. But Marijuana has the active substance, which is tetrahydrocannabinol, THC, which is in it, which has a slew of nasty side effects, one of which is affecting um, fertility in men and women. What THC does is when it comes in contact with sperm, it changes the, the shape of the sperm cell and makes it difficult to get pregnant. So you have a couple where maybe the man has been smoking marijuana, so the sperm he produces is somewhat in ineffective. Or you have a man who's not smoking marijuana, but his wife may be smoking marijuana. And the minute the marijuana, um, the THC gets in contact with the sperm cells, it changes it and they can't get pregnant. But they think they're using a natural herbal product. Marijuana has a slew of issues attached to it. And, you know, also legally it's not allowed, it's banned. But people tend to undercut the um, effect of marijuana and, re and don't realize that it's really more effective than helpful, um, really more harmful than helpful. We're still speaking about abuse. Now, another type of abuse would be the, you know, painkillers and yes. the overuse of certain drugs. Let's yes. talk about yes. pain painkiller addiction. Yes, opioids is what you're, you, where you're going. So basically, maybe you see somebody who maybe they got into a car accident, so to speak, and maybe the person has legitimate pain, right? There's been trauma to the body. And so maybe they were prescribed opioids, like maybe morphine or maybe tramadol. And, you know, they've been using it for a while and they become hooked on it. And how one knows that you become hooked on it is, one, you're using the drug when you don't have any pain. You're using it around the clock to function, to cope, to feel normal. Two, when you don't take the drug, there's withdrawal symptoms. Like they get jittery, they, they are sweating a lot, they just feel irritable, things are just not moving smoothly. Whereas prior to the accident and the need for the drug, they didn't have any of these symptoms. 
Another way that we as healthcare professionals try to look at people who may potentially be addicted is they have what's called pinpoint pupils, dilated pupils. So basically, their eyes look a bit strange. And then you see people that go out of their way to source the drug, where, for instance, like maybe I live in Lekki, for instance, and maybe all the pharmacies in my neighborhood know that I'm somebody who's always coming for tramadol, and they know that I don't need it anymore, so they refuse to sell to me. Now I start traveling to Ikeja and Suleri and Festac and other parts of the mainland just so I can get that drug. Those are some signs that, okay, maybe this thing is not as under control as one would imagine. So um, what, are, what would you say are some of the other areas of abuse that you'd mm -hmm. like us to okay. address? Maybe more, let's focus now on over-the-counter medication, which yes. is something that we happen to do a lot yes, here. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. I think that's one that's near and dear to my heart as a practicing clinical pharmacist. You see people that come in all the time. Nigerians, we, we have this unfortunate habit of blaming everything on, on malaria. My head hurts, it must be malaria. My legs are shaking, it must be malaria. I feel cold, it must be malaria. And to be frank, malaria is an infection. So unless you've been bitten by a mosquito, infected with the parasite that causes malaria, you don't necessarily have malaria just because something is wrong with you. That's one thing. So we don't do enough rapid diagnostic tests on malaria to say, okay, this, these are my symptoms. I know I don't feel well, but am I, do I really have malaria or is it something else that's causing it? That's one. So we do abuse anti-malarials quite a bit. And the danger in that is that, you know, the parasite can change, can mutate. So once it gets used to being exposed over and over again to a drug, right, all of a sudden the drug is no longer as effective. If you remember maybe 10, 15 years ago, prior to the onset of at a metal We have the chloroquine. Exactly. And chloroquine was effective for a while. And then they found out after a while, chloroquine is not so effective anymore and it has been restricted to a really small subset of the population because we were overdoing it with the chloroquine. And my concern, and, and most healthcare professionals share the same concern, is that after we overuse it, when we don't have malaria or we treat mal malaria routinely, we hear all sorts of stories. Some people say, oh, I haven't treated malaria this month. And I'm like, but do you have malaria? They say, oh, no, I just want to take it just in case. But it doesn't work that way. So can I please shed some light on that? Yes. We hear that there are preventive measures one can take or preventive Absolutely. medication one can take Absolutely. to prevent malaria Absolutely. as opposed to treating malaria when Absolutely. you don't have it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And to be frank, and, you know, as a pharmacist, everything is not drug related. You know, there are many measures that you can take to prevent getting malaria or reduce your risk for getting malaria. You know, of course, we, we go back to our primary school days where they taught us how malaria is transmitted or how the mosquitoes are bred, you know, staying around pools of stagnant water. You can use a mosquito net. You can use a mosquito repellent. There are a lot of creams that you can buy over the counter to prevent mosquitoes from biting you. And then even more so, we ourselves need to boost our immune systems. You know, I know a lot of people use a lot of vitamin C and things like that, which is really great. Uh, immune booster, but there are a lot of things we can do besides just always taking drugs. And the most important thing is don't assume that the minute something is wrong with you, meaning I feel a bit feverish, or maybe I just feel down in general, maybe I'm, I'm running out of energy, it's not always malaria. So you should always do a rapid diagnostic test, which then once it's positive, you can now take anti-malaria. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Mordi. So what would you say would be your final tips to people? You've given a lot of tips. Yes. First to spread, how can we spread this message right. around to ensure that you know not only us are aware, but other people around us are aware? That's an excellent question. I think that we should take better um, responsibility for our health as Nigerians. Um, we shouldn't always listen to our non-medical friends, so to speak. So we get a lot of requests when people come in and say, oh, somebody told me to take a certain drug. And then by the time you question the person and you ask them questions, you realize that drug is completely inappropriate. But because it worked for that particular person, this person now thinks, oh, it will work for me as well. But you and that person are totally different, and you may have totally different diseases. So one, stop listening to advice medical advice from non-medical professionals. Number two, everything that's wrong with you is not always malaria. Always try to see a medical professional. Pharmacists are easily accessible. Most pharmacies, you walk in there, you can talk to a pharmacist free of charge. Three, you yourself should stop self-medicating. So don't share pills amongst friends. So it, just because one person was prescribed something doesn't necessarily mean all of us are supposed to use the same exact thing. And even more so, if you are shortening that person's um, ration, so to speak, for drugs, you get to a point where what that person is treating may not even be fully treated because you have shared 
the drugs for one person amongst two. Thank you so much. And also, just because the certain medication worked for you before, doesn't mean that if the symptoms um, come again, exactly. you just run to the pharmacy and say, ah, last time, doctor gave me so-and-so, so please give me so-and-so exactly. as well. Exactly. <laughs> Perfectly Thank said. you so much for joining my us. Pleasure, We've been joined by pleasure. Dr. Dumebi Mordi. She is a pharmacist and a doctor. She's a pharmacist with over 15 years pharmaceutical knowledge, and she's also the, co the founder and the owner of RX 3.0 Pharmacy. She shared with us all the do's and don'ts we need to know when it comes especially to drug abuse. To enjoy more of this, our Ugonke videos when you just watch, press this button to subscribe on top of our YouTube page. You go love her.